Seeing Ambrose Light Tower off in the distance lets us know that we are nearly to the site of the relief shipwreck. Let's now take a look at the history of this light ship. The relief light ship was built by the New York Shipbuilding Company of Camden, New Jersey in 1904. She was 129 feet long, had a 28.6 foot beam, displaced 566 tons, and was powered by a single 600 horsepower General Motors diesel engine. The light ship also carried one of the world's most powerful lights as its beacon. Back in the 1950s, light ships were stationed all along the eastern seaboard at predetermined locations. The floating lighthouse's beacon signaled an accurate location to those vessels whose navigation equipment was nowhere near as sophisticated as it is today. On June 24, 1960, the Red Hulled Lightship, bearing her name Relief in white letters on her side, was on station filling in for the Ambrose Lightship, Wall 613, which was detained in Staten Island for her yearly overhaul. The Relief Ship was on station and sitting in a dense fog that was so heavy it caused serious delays at New York's international airports. The Wild 505's beacons were flashing and her foghorn was sounding at regular intervals when she was struck on her starboard side amidships and at a right angle by the Class C2 10,270-ton freighter Green Bay. The impact created a 15-degree roll for the light ship, and water instantly rushed into her engine room and compressor room through an open watertight door. The crew acted quickly, and no one was hurt. The men could not reach the lifeboat because of its location with reference to the crash point. Instead, they launched an inflatable rubber raft. Captain Tamolinus described the light ship's final minutes before sinking, saying, she sank stern first, kicked up her nose, and went straight down. The captain of the Green Bay had apparently misinterpreted the location of the light ship on his radar screen. The relief ship had gone down in an area known as Wreck Valley. She now rests upright and relatively intact in 110 feet of water just east of the Ambrose Tower. Her light masts were wire dragged down so as not to cause a hazard to navigation. This three-dimensional shipwreck is now excellent for the novice and experienced wreck divers alike. Once in the water, divers will find that the water on the wreck is usually dark but clear. Average visibility is around 20 feet. Please bear in mind that this is only an average and actual visibility can range from zero to over 40 feet. The Ambrose Lightship, while 613, which had been under repair at the time of the incident, can now be viewed at New York's South Street Seaport. I highly recommend a tour of this lightship because it gives divers the chance to see exactly what the relief ship looked like and her layout. Divers should also take good mental notes as to the structural layout of the vessel, as this knowledge will make navigation on the wreck much simpler. Another hint is to note where and how possible artifacts are mounted, so that when you get to the wreck, you know where and what to look for. As a side note, back in 1976, a group of divers led by Al Catalfumo made six trips to the site and recovered one of her 60-foot long, 6,000-pound light masts. According to Al, the mast can now be viewed in front of a dive shop in Lawrence Harbor, New Jersey. Other notable artifacts recovered from this wreck include the huge brass bell, which was brought up by Billy DeMargini and the Aquarians Dive Club. This barnacle-encrusted ceiling lamp and this beautiful brass compass were found by diver Ed Molly of New Jersey. And this unique brass doorknob and keys to the relief ship's radio room were recovered by Captain George Quirk. Once the Genie 2 is securely anchored into the wreck, we each make our way to the side and jump into the clear blue Atlantic. As we start our descent, 
we are once again pleased to find ourselves in relatively clear water. We will descend along the Genie 2's anchor line, which will lead us directly to the relief shipwreck. At around 40 feet, we pass the mate, who had descended first to secure the grapple anchor into the wreck. By the time we descend to 90 feet and reach the wreck, ambient or surrounding light has diminished greatly, but the water is still clear. The anchor is tied near the relief ship's stern. Due to the darkness, a dive light is not only highly recommended, but almost a necessity when exploring this wreck, even if no penetration is planned. Rick is using a small light mounted to his hood and a powerful dive right handheld light that's powered by a battery pack mounted to his tanks. Another good idea is to use a tether line reel for navigation. Attach the line near the anchor, as Billy Campbell has just done, and then carefully let the line spool out as you swim off to explore the site. It's a good idea to keep the slack out of the line and be careful not to get yourself tangled. Then when the dive is over, returning back to the anchor becomes merely a matter of reeling yourself back in. This method of navigation is especially useful in murky water or when exploring a wreck that you're not very familiar with. You will note that most of the Wreck Valley dive team chooses to use dry suits for thermal protection on these deeper wrecks. Wet suits can also be used, but they will not provide the same level of warmth and comfort in these sometimes chilly waters. The relief ship's stern is round and easy to locate. Her main deck is covered with debris and has many corroded holes allowing divers to see deep into her interior. Although the depth to the bottom on this wreck is over 105 feet, divers can keep their dives shallower than 100 feet by remaining on top of the light ship's deck. By limiting depth in this manner, it's possible to enjoy a slightly longer bottom time. Rick Schwarz finds an opening through the vessel's steel deck and descends feet first down into the dark interior. Billy also enters the same room, but through a slightly larger deck hatch. Remember that penetration into any shipwreck requires the proper advanced dive training, special equipment, and experience. Once inside the wreck, divers must move very carefully because visibility can be quickly reduced to zero if the silt-covered floor is kicked up. On the port side wall, we spot a brass backing plate to a porthole. The swing plate, or glass door, has already been removed by sport divers. Billy now leads the way forward through the port side corridor, carefully keeping his fins high so as not to kick up the silt. Bill stops to take a quick look into an interior doorway before continuing his penetration forward. These interior rooms may conceal many artifacts, but all that's visible to us on this exploratory dive are ling and a few other small fish. As we continue forward, the corridor opens up and we find ourselves in a large room. On the floor is a colorful sea raven, nestled between falling debris. Bill finds a diver's lost light that may have fallen through one of the many openings in the wreck's deck. Since we planned on a short penetration today, so we could film the entire exterior of the wreck, it's now time to exit, and we start to backtrack our way through the silt, letting the penetration line lead us to the exit. Rick exits the wreck first, followed by Bill, who reels in his line as he exits back out through the same rectangular deck hatch he came in. distance from our anchor, Billy swims past one of the relief ship's light masts. The mast has a crow's nest, which is still easily identifiable by sport divers, and is a favorite backdrop for photographers and videographers alike. By looking down through the wreck's broken and corroded deck, 
Rick spots a sink still securely mounted onto an interior wall. After dropping over the port side and continuing our swim towards the bow, we can't help but to take note of the abundant, thick layer of marine life that is thriving on this wrecked steel hull. Since this wreck has been heavily explored since the 1960s when she went down, we are not surprised by the empty porthole openings. What does surprise us is that Rick finds one that still contains the porthole's brass backing plate. Porthole backing plates are secured to the wreck with steel rivets. Rick takes out his sledgehammer and chisel and goes to work. After a short time, Rick is successful only at removing one of the remaining rivets. Recovery of this porthole will have to be left until another day and another dive. On the wreck's deck are a number of cleats. These cleats are excellent landmarks for divers to use for navigation around the wreck. That is, once a diver has learned where each is located on the site. There is also an anchor davit still in place on the wreck's deck. I take a moment to film Steve Lombardo and Donovan as they swim past on their way towards the bow. After a little more swimming, we finally reach the bow. The relief ship's bow is easily recognizable, and as is the rest of the wreck, heavily covered in marine growth. Due to the depth and our bottom time, we must now start to head back to the anchor line. Swimming back along the relief ship's port side, again, we are amazed at the thick and colorful coating of marine growth that blanket her hull. Billy reels in his tether line as he slowly makes his way astern. Divers can catch lobsters on the wreck, but they are not very abundant. Back on the main deck, but still heading back to the anchor, Bill passes one of the relief ship's mast stumps. An angler must have lost his pole when fishing over the wreck recently. The pole is now snag into the wreck's crow's nest. Billy finally reaches the end of his line and carefully clips off his tether line reel before beginning his slow ascent to the surface. Rick's planned bottom time has also ended and he makes his way back to the anchor and starts to ascend. Due to the depth of this wreck and our bottom time, we ascend to 20 feet and start our safety decompression hang. We are already planning another visit to this dynamic little three-dimensional shipwreck. Rick to work on the porthole and Billy and I to explore deeper inside the wreck's interior. Who knows what we may find. Right back. Damn it.